So, uh, yesterday we finished off, let's do more yield criteria. Uh, criteria. Uh, we really briefly hit the von Mises yield criterion. Which, um, let's get there. All right, cool. Uh, which showed, so if you remember, the idea is for the von Mises criterion, hydrostatic pressure won't cause failure in a material. So if you have an equal stress applied in every direction, it, it doesn't do anything, it just deforms elastically. And so if we take that hydrostatic part out of our, out of our stress tensor, we get a deviatoric part of it, which is just the deviatoric is the, the part of the stress sensor that makes it twist and makes it deform. So a von Mises criterion is also sometimes known as a, as a maximum distortion energy criterion. Max distortion energy criterion. So Basically, we're, we're measuring the, the part of the stress that's causing our material to twist and distort and deform um, with the idea that that directly relates to, to shearing of the material where for a ductile material, shear is what's going to cause failure. Um, so our, our formulation for that, there's a whole bunch of math behind it, but we end up with something um, that is, I'm going to write this now as a, as a square. In terms of principal stresses, our sigma one minus sigma two squared uh, to uh, sigma two minus sigma three squared, sigma three minus sigma one squared. Uh, and we say failure happens when that's greater than or equal to the yield strength squared. So failure happens if um, if this condition is true. This uh, gets simplified a little bit in two dimensions. So this is the general three-dimensional mm -hmm. criterion. Um, it gets simplified in 2D if we assume uh, this is for 3D. Uh, for 2D, specifically a state of uh, plane stress where sigma 3 is equal to 0, this becomes one half uh, sigma one minus sigma sigma two squared. There's a sigma two squared, a sigma one squared, which then we can write as sigma one minus sigma one sigma two sigma two squared is greater than or equal to our sigma yield. So. Failure happens in, in two dimensions if, uh, if in terms of our principal stresses, this is true. So I'll go through some examples of, of what this actually means um, in terms of our, our stress state if for, a, for a general stress state on a, on a material. First, I wanted to, to plot this out to give you a visualization. So if you remember yesterday, we had, there's the first two criteria we went through, there was a maximum stress criteria. So we're going to look at um, our stress in turn in a in our, our stress space plotted out in terms of sigma one and sigma two. This is a similar idea to what we do with our Mohr circle. So Mohr circle, we're, we're plotting axial stress versus a, a shear stress space. Now we're plotting principal stress space. So I'm plotting principal stress one versus principal stress two because those are useful quantities to look at. Um, so our, our max stress criteria or our, our Tresca criteria, I guess. Um, so Tresca. Let's do this. where this is sigma yield, this is also sigma yield, minus sigma yield, minus sigma yield. So 
So a max stress criteria says if I'm inside this box bounded by my maximum tensile, uh, ma maximum compression stress, then I survive. The Tresca criterion specifically looked at shear strength, so it kind of cut off these edges here and said, all right, if I'm uh, if there's shear happening, which is going on on either of these sides, and I'm inside this box, then failure happens. The von Mises criterion, this is actually the equation of, of an ellipse, of a, of a kind of rotated ellipse. Uh, so it looks like, in relation to the Tresca criterion, doo -doo -doo, is something like this. So there's it crosses... It, these two criteria intersect at the yield points. Uh, they intersect at this point along a, a 45 degree here, uh, and the von Mises extends slightly beyond the Tresca in the other uh, ever, everywhere else. So, what each of these spaces are, basically, if I if I take a box, this upper right quadrant is when I have a material being biaxially stressed. This quadrant, my principal stress one is negative, so I'm compressing it like this. But my principal stress two is positive, so I'm pulling it like that. Um, that may look familiar to you as a as a as a rotated pure shear state, um, and I'll show an example on that in a minute. This corner, we have compression going in both directions, and this corner. We have uh, positive sigma one and negative sigma two. So that's kind of what each of these quadrants represents. Along this line, along the sigma one line, this is it being pulled axially with no stress in that direction. Here in the sigma two line, this is being pulled vertically with no stress in the sigma one direction. Kind of, and similarly out here, this is being compressed axially, being compressed axially in this direction, and here, this is being compressed axially in this direction. So this is kind of what what we're trying to represent by plotting our, our material out in this stress space, is showing, okay, if I have a state of biaxial stress now, uh, I, I exist. I exist somewhere in this in this upper right quadrant of our principal stress space. Um, uh, here, this is our von Mises, and here, this is our Tresca inside. Just to label those. Okay, so most of the problems we'll deal with will be in two dimensions, uh, or at least that will. I'll be testing you guys on in the exam will be in two dimensions. So uh, you don't necessarily need this three-dimensional formulation, just know how this simplification happens. So specifically that there is a full 3D formulation and we simplify it by assuming a plane stress condition that sigma 3 is zero. Um, there was, oh, right. Uh, so this quantity, this whole thing here is also known as an equivalent stress. So basically when you have one of these complicated three-dimensional stress states or two-dimensional stress states, it's useful from an engineering standpoint because it's hard to wrap your brain around what three-dimensional states of stress look like uh, and what that means. It's easy to represent the single number. So this equivalent stress, this Mises stress, which are the same thing, um, is a nice way to take all of those stress components and, and boil it down to one number in there. So we just say, all right, I have one equivalent stress on this material, no matter what the, the stress state is. So if you hear equivalent stress, <laughs> it's the same thing as the Mises stress, and it comes from that, uh, from that formulation. Okay, questions on that? Yeah. Yes, and I'll uh, I'll give at the very end I'll give some examples on on anisotropic material failure criteria, which I don't expect you to know, but it, it's useful to, to at least see how that gets done. Good question. The Tresca 
criteria and it was also for ductile materials? Yes. So in the, the region bounded by the ellipse but not by the little the Yeah. What, what's going on there? Good question. Um, in the third example, I'll, I'll show what that means. Yeah. Okay. Other questions? Right. Uh, and just as a reminder, our, our Tresca criterion is in 2D when sigma 1 minus sigma 2 over 2 is greater than or equal to the yield strength over 2. Um, failure happens there. Um, and I'll, I'll use both of these, this uh, von Mises criterion, uh, Mises, Mises, Mises criterion, uh, and the Truska criterion in these examples. So I'll show how both of those get used. Uh, okay. Other questions? Yeah. There's supposed to be for the minus sigma 1, sigma 2 for the von Mises. Is that supposed to be over 2? No. Um, so here, when you, so this is sigma 1 squared minus 2, sigma 1, sigma 2, mm -hmm. plus sigma 2 squared, then there's, or here. Oh, no, yeah, yeah. 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 Then this comes into that, this goes into that, and then the half cancels all those 2s out. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. So, it, yeah, it looks weird, which is why then it's a, a skewed ellipse. Um, yeah. But it comes from assuming plane stress. Cool. Cool, cool, cool. All right. So let's go through some examples of how this actually gets used. And I'll hopefully kind of get you to visualize what goes on in these stress spaces and these, uh, these failure surfaces. So the first example, just to start off simple, we're going to do uniaxial tension. So pulling on a bar or some block with some stress sigma. I know my principal stress one now is that sigma. My principal stress two is just zero. The shear stress is also zero, or I guess if there's principal stresses, I don't need to worry about that. Um, we can plug this into our Mises criterion. So we have, now this would be sigma squared minus sigma times zero plus zero squared is greater than or equal to sigma yield. Our Tresca criterion uh, is sigma minus zero absolute value over two is greater than or equal to sigma yield. So both of these get to the same point, sorry, there's a squared here, of uh, failure happens when sigma is greater than sigma yield. So failure happens when sigma is greater than sigma yield. So what this looks like in our stress space, da, da, da. let's go Mises Basically, here we're we're traversing along this sigma one axis, and right when, right along here, when we pass this point uh, of our failure surface, we get failure to happen. So, this is what we would expect when from our uniaxial tension experiment when you. This is where we actually get this yield strength number. When we pass the uniaxial tensile strength, failure happens. Here, using these failure criteria, we end up at that same thing. So plugging values into our failure criteria, we say, OK, when, our, when my stress axial stress is greater than sigma yield, then failure happens. Yeah. Oh, there should be an over 2 here. Sorry. Did I write that for the other one? Yes. So for the, the Tresca criterion here. <coughs> 
So then we kind of, this is like a, a sanity check. So we go and we say, all right, uniaxial tension fails when we go past the yield strength. Cool, that makes sense. For another simple case, we can look at pure shear. Do, do, do. Example, pure shear. So this one now, we have a stress here that I'm going to call tap, where now, if I want to look at my stress tensor in 2D, this looks something like that. Um, if I want to find principal stresses, we can look at our Moore's circle, which we've gone through this example a couple times now, uh, so I'm not going to belabor it, but there's some tau here. This is also tau. This is minus tau. So there's then an equivalent stress state here. Uh, if we rotate this tau minus tau zero zero, or principal stress one is tau, principal stress two is minus tau, and that's basically if we rotated our block, we have a tension that way and a compression going these ways with magnitude tau, or oh, I'm getting into this double negative sign convention again. I'm just gonna I'm gonna leave this as positive for now and just show that it's going in. Um, so plugging these now into our two failure criteria. So we have uh, for our, our Mises criterion, we then can say, if you remember, sigma one squared minus sigma one sigma two plus sigma two squared is greater than or equal to sigma yield squared. Uh, our Tresca criterion, sigma one minus sigma two over two is greater than or equal to sigma y over two. Um, this now is tau squared minus tau times minus tau plus uh, minus tau squared, which is equal to three tau squared is greater than or equal to sigma y. So for our von Mises criterion, failure happens <coughs> when tau is greater than or equal to our sigma yield over square root three. Which again, this is where this square root three number comes in um, from, the, from the hardening formulation and from, for the torsion lab. Yes, <coughs> that should be squared. Our Tresca criterion now. Do, do, do. Uh, we just have absolute value of tau minus minus tau over 2, which conveniently is equal to tau, which again, this is our maximum shear stress. So for pure shear, this is, we just have a shear stress that. Uh, Failure happens when this is greater than or equal to sigma y over two. So now we see that these are slightly different. These are no longer the same value. So what ha what we're looking at in in our stress space. Do, do, do. Draw our Tresca triangle again. one, sigma two. When we're applying this state of pure shear, our, our sigma one and sigma two are equal and opposite value. So here we're actually going positive sigma one, negative sigma two. We're going along this diagonal line. So this is our, our pure shear line. So in stress space, in our, in our principal stress space, that's what this looks like. And so with a Tresca criterion, we say failure happens when this pure stress state, pure, pure shear line crosses our Tresca yield there. 
and our Mises criterion fails when we cross this line here. So whether or not the material has actually failed kind of depends on the material. Um, it turns out for most, so again, these two criteria, the, the von Mises and the Tresca criteria are better for uh, ductile materials. It turns out for the most part, the von Mises criterion is a better uh, way of, of figuring out whether a material has failed or not. Tresca is simpler, it's easier to calculate because you're not throwing in any squares, there's no weird deviatoric component, you just say what's the maximum shear stress? All right, if it's greater then it failed. Um, but it turns out von Mises is a more useful criteria in general, not always the case. Um, there's also, if you remember, uh, our maximum stress criterion. So max normal stress, uh, which would say here our, our max shear or our maximum sigma one is equal to tau y, and failure would happen when our sigma when that was greater than the yield strength of the material, or or when minus tau was less than uh, sigma yield. Minus tau was less than minus sigma yield. Yeah. So what that looks like is if we draw these lines out here, da, 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 this should cross in the middle, but it's not. Um, it's basically when we cross this corner of our maximum of our of our stress space here. So with a von Mises, uh, with a Tresca criterion, you say failure happens when when your when your shear stress is greater than sigma of y over two, von Mises sigma y over three. Uh, normal stress is when it's just greater than that sigma y. So here, a max normal stress would predict the highest stress for a for a pure shear experiment. But this actually sometimes works. So if you remember now. Uh, I'm gonna pull back to our chalk experiment from yesterday, which I didn't actually fully explain, um, which I'm going to talk about now. The so when we apply a torque to our chalk, if I look at some little brick in the middle here. There's some shear stress tau, but if I look at it in a different orientation, I can say on the surface, there's some axial stress and some compressive stress here, tau and minus tau again. Um, so for your ductile materials, the, the plane in which the maximum shear stress is acting is just horizontal. So you just have some, some maximum shear stress acting horizontally along the sample, which is why in the torsion test that you did on the metal bars, all of your failure surfaces, for the most part, should have been flat, because that's the, that's the axis where that maximum shear stress is acting on, or that's the kind of plane along which it's acting. But for our chalk, chalk is a brittle material, which it turns out doesn't fail under shear very easily, but does fail under tension. So when we were doing that torsion experiment on the chalk, what didn't what it didn't actually matter what the shear stress was. What mattered is how that resolved into the 45 degree angle here. So we were actually getting failure there along a 45, because that was the direction orthogonal or the perpendicular direction to where the maximum tensile stress was acting. So again, it failed via a maximum normal stress criterion, a maximum tensile stress. It just happened that given the stress state that we were looking at, that was 45 degrees, um, or kind of along that, that weird helix pattern in that chalk. So we can expect failure to happen kind of twisting along this chalk surface now. Yeah. Cool. Questions? <laughs>
No? All right. I don't know if you're disinterested or if your minds have been blown. Um, could be one or the other. <laughs> or both. <laughs> All right. Um, so now I'm going to do a little bit more of a practical example with some numbers, because numbers are always useful. Um, so let's look at a fun example of a twist and pull. This and the pole. So um, now I'm going to take some circular rod. I'm going to apply some twist to it, and I'm going to pull it at the same time. Uh, I'm not going to go through the whole calculation of if I apply X amount of torque, I get X amount of shear on this thing. I'm just going to tell you the maximum shear stress on the outer surface due to that torque, um, or T, maybe T on the, on the R is equal to R naught, uh, is equal to 3 MPa, and my stress that I'm applying axially is 8 MPa. So I, I have some block here, I guess somewhere on the outside of the sample. Um, I have some stress state now that is 8330. Um, I can figure out what my principal stresses are uh, a number of ways. I'm going to go back to our Morse circle and I will hopefully do it right this time. Um, I can say there's some point at uh, 0, 3 and some point at 8, 3. Draw the circle there. Um, this center of the circle and that some radius r. My center is at uh, 8 plus 0 over 2, um, which is just 4. Uh, oh, 8 minus 0 over 2 over 4. My radius now, square root of uh, 8 plus 0 over 2 squared plus 3 squared, which I've conveniently chosen to be 5, um, which is why I chose the numbers that I did. Uh, for this material, I'm going to say that it has a yield strength, uh, sigma y, of 10 MPa. So this is kind of a, like a, a weak plastic, maybe a thermoplastic material. Um, two to two. Here now, my principal stresses, <laughs> sigma one is four plus my five, nine. Sigma two is minus one. Um, where am I? There we go. Okay. So now I'm going to plug some of these into our, our von Mises and our Trespic criterion. So or uh, with von Mises, then I would have 9 squared minus 9 times minus 1 plus minus 1 squared, which should be 91. And we say with our yield strength of 10 MPa, this is less than our 10 squared or 100 MPa squared. Um, so with a von Mises criteria, this material survives. There is no failure here yet. With our Tresca criteria, Tresca, um, this would be absolute value of 9 minus negative 1, which is equal to 5, which is also equal to our yield strength over 2, which is equal to 5. So based on the Tresca criteria, we're just starting to fail our material. So this thing fails. So what does that mean in terms of our stress space? So now, da, da, da. let's draw this out. So we're following a line that's kind of somewhere along here-ish. Uh, 
our, our sigma 1, sigma 2. So we have a, a pretty large sigma 1 and a lower sigma 2. Basically, we're, we're right here at this point in our stress space now. So we're saying with a Tresca yield criteria, along this line, we're just starting to hit our Tresca failure criterion. So if we were using that, we would say our material had <laughs> failed. Um, but with the von Mises criterion, which is maybe a more accurate criteria, we're actually still inside this, this failure surface. So our material under that criteria wouldn't have failed. Again, so whether or not the material actually has failed, you kind of have to do an experiment and test um, and see which of these criteria or what other criteria works best. It should. Yep. <laughs> that is true. Thank you. Good catch. Okay. I guess same idea, but thank you for catching that. Um, so here we're we're still we're hitting this Tresca surface and we have we're still inside our von Mises surface. So failure wouldn't have happened there. Um, so this is where some of the nuances with exactly what failure criteria you use come up. If you remember, our, our von Mises criteria was developed in like 1919, um, I think. Let me look back. Down. Uh, no, 1913. So since then, there have been a lot, a lot of different failure criteria that have been developed. I mean, that was now over 100 years ago that this that this was come up with. But it's still, because it's so general and because it's used for isotropic materials, which engineers, as engineers, we like to assume all of our materials are, uh, it's still used very prevalently today. So I wanted to, if I can get this to work, uh, let's see. Show an example. weird. Okay. Uh, let's see if I can get this to go. Results. Open. Nope. That's also weird. This, uh, oh, come on. How are you not? Nope. Maybe I can't get this to work. Okay. I'm going to try doing this. Um, and there's going to be other ones? Oh, why are you over there? So I ran a simulation yesterday on a tensile experiment, and apparently it didn't save anywhere, um, despite me having <laughs> saved it on this. For people who use the remote desktop, you can save stuff on here, right? It doesn't just delete your... <sighs> Damn. <laughs> Damn. Cool. That's good to know for the future. Um, so instead, I'll just kind of briefly walk you through this. So this is, I guess, just an example of, a, of some <laughs> one of the preloaded ones that Abacus has. This, this is Abacus, a finite element software, um, which 
as an engineer, if you're doing any sort of mechanical analysis, you're going to be using this or ANSYS or, or some other finite element solver. Uh, they even have them in, in like SolidWorks. They'll have a finite element solver. It's really crude, and they can only do linear elastic stuff, but it still is something. Um, but what you'll see in here, actually, is what, what it ends up reporting. Um, these are all bar elements, so it doesn't work as well. But it's actually reporting uh, a Mises stress here. So in finite element solvers, this, this Mises stress, this equivalent stress, is, is one of the most common things that gets reported. Because for again, from an engineering standpoint, it's a very useful quantity to look at. Because we just want to know, all right, what's the equivalent stress on this body? And is it greater than my, my yield surface? And is it going to cause failure? There's also in here uh, maximum principal stress, minimum principal stress. Uh, there's a Tresca criterion. Uh, there's an S11, uh, which if this was a full three-dimensional body, you'd have 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, 1, 2, 1, 3, 2, 3, um, the full thing. But because these are bar elements, they're just 1D things. Uh, that's all that's popping up. So uh, if I had saved my, my thing to U-Drive, I could have actually shown a, a full 3D thing, but oh well, this is still the, the same idea. So when you see these in finite element solvers, when you see these quantities, this is where they're all coming from, those, those formulations. And they're still, they're very useful quantities for engineers to know. Um, cool. So that was a, a failed experiment. Switch back to this and try to. Can't even exit out of this thing. Okay. okay. Uh, there is. Oh, we got a few minutes left. There's one thing I want to mention really quickly, and then I'm going to show a couple different failure criteria. Um, factor of safety. So, also as engineers, this. You may or may not have heard factor of safety before. Um, maybe like show of hands, people have heard that word before. Cool, all of you, awesome, great. So uh, I won't dwell on it too much then, but basically it's it's the ratio between your working stress and your yield stress, which, where are we? Sure, yield strength over working stress. So normally this is just a sigma yield. Um, it's most commonly, like for most engineering materials, especially metals, uh, you'll report this as your equivalent stress, so your von Mises uh, equivalent stress, stress, that, uh, um, you could also report it over your Tresca stress, or, or max shear. You could report it in terms of your, your principal stresses. It all kind of depends on your failure criteria that you're using. But basically, it's, it's just that, that ratio between where your material is going to fail and uh, where, how, how far along to fail your, your material is. So um, in turn, our stress space, do 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 do. Sigma one, sigma two. It's kind of how far along, say I have a point here, and my failure surface is here. It's how far you are from your failure surface for any given stress state, which again is normally reported in terms of Mises stress or equivalent stress. Um, yeah, if if you're doing a uniaxial tension experiment, it could just be the tensile stress over the or the yield stress over the tensile stress that you're applying. Um, for different engineering disciplines, um, stuff like auto, you're looking at factor of safeties of like one and a half to two. Um, for aerospace, you're looking at like 1.15, 1 1.2. 1 uh, for civil engineering, you're looking at like eight. Uh, but basically, it's, it's how much you need to overbuild your structure. So say I, I was adding a, a, a tension cable to a bridge, right? Um, and I knew on any given day that tension cable uh, would be experiencing a kiloton of force. Uh, I need to, to make sure my, the thickness of my bar is enough that a kiloton of force is half or less of that yield strength. Um, and 
as your uncertainty grows, you need a higher factor of safety. So if you know exactly what your state of stress is going to be and exactly how the material is going to perform, particularly over time with material degradation due to fatigue and due to heat properties, whatever, um, you know that you can make a material that's X, X thick. And the, the closer you get to this factor of safety, generally the lighter your material will be uh, or the lighter your structure will be. So if it's, if it's moving, if it's a car or an airplane, you save more gas. Um, if it's a bridge or civil building, you're using less material to construct it. You save money there, but there's a higher probability of failure the closer you get to this point. Uh, but again, it all depends on what your failure criteria is. So um, real quickly, I'm going to go through, I'm just going to show a couple other types of failure criteria that are fairly popular or fairly common uh, that you may hear of. So uh, there yield criteria. Um, I won't necessarily be testing you on this, but they I think they're kind of interesting and useful to know. There we go. Um, so one of the more common ones, uh, more common ones, more Coulomb. Uh, so what this is, if you remember, uh, for our max stress criteria, there was a big difference between the tensile and the compressive stress. Um, more Coulomb kind of takes that and, and cuts it off. So it's good for uh, brittle materials like concrete uh, and soils. Uh, and basically what we have is um, where our big max stress criteria looked something like this, where we had a big bounding box with lower tensile strength and higher compressive strength. More Coulomb takes that and kind of cuts it off. And so it just draws lines in between there. Uh, there's a more mathematical formulation behind that and how that all works, but this is the general idea is then you Remember, this is a this is a shear space. So, uh, when you're applying shear, you you normally exist in in one of these spaces. So it says, all right, if if you're shearing your material, then you could cause failure to happen too. Uh, it's not just when it crosses this line out here. There's another common one called the Drucker Prager. Uh, Drucker Prager, uh, which basically takes the more Coulomb and smooths it out. This is kind of a, a gross over approximation. Uh, Drucker, uh, and this is more Coulomb on the inside. Uh, smooths out uh, more Coulomb. Um, there's another one that's useful for anisotropic materials. So uh, it's called a, a Hill criterion, which is named after a guy named Rodney Hill, who's actually, I think this, he put a, this paper out in 1964, if I remember right. Um, but basically, our, our von Mises criterion looks something like this. The Hill criterion he said, well, maybe it's not always isotropic. Uh, and then he threw coefficients in front of all of the terms of, your, of, the, of the von Mises criterion and used that to kind of extend out this space. So then you kind of have this weird elongated ellipse sort of thing. So this would be von Mises and this would be Hill, which is very good in general for, it, it was originally designed for anisotropic metals. Anisotropic metals, um, specifically ones that are, that are cold rolled or drawn, because uh, then the crystal grains, remember, rotate and you have high anisotropy in that direction. So this is a very useful criteria for that. People also use it for composite materials like carbon fiber epoxy composites, um, and it turns out to be still fairly useful there. 
um, maybe not a perfect criterion, but it's a nice, it's a simple mathematical formulation because the idea is you're you're taking this complicated stress state, sigma one, x, y, z, shears in all the directions, and you're boiling it down to a single number. So the goal of all of these failure criterion is to kind of get a very simple criterion for where failure will happen. Um, you can make them more complicated. They're criteria that have like a like a rounded back half and then just kind of concatenate the front half. So you can combine like a Tresca and a von Mises. You can do that and you can extend it. You can add, I don't know, you, you could have like weird lines going inside here. There's, for the last like 50 years of solid mechanics research, there's been a whole lot of weird stuff that's gone on with those, all for very specialized materials. Okay. Basically, 